Hello, and welcome to Dawncasting. Today's video features a commentated playthrough of the game Dawncaster, and will be the first of what I hope to be a series of commentated playthroughs. Before we get into that, however, I would like to mention, as I was making this video, the Dawncaster team announced their new expansion, the Masks of Misery, where we will experience the macabre, the strange, and the sinister. As usual, the expansion will contain three new maps to explore, and all of the associated goodies in those maps, like new enemies and such. In addition, for the base game, the devs will be adding over 40 brand new cards. Releasing April 17th, you can check the Discord for the full update post. Now getting back to our playthrough, for this run I've decided to go with one of the stronger builds in the game and one that is a personal favorite of mine, the Bless Knight. This playstyle revolves around granting yourself powerful beneficial status effects known as blessings. We will mainly achieve this by combining various sources of divine energy generation and the key card, Favor of the Gods, which as you can see here, grants you blessings based on your divine energy. With that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at our starting setup. Now for my basic attack, weapon power, and starting card, I will be using something other than my ideal choices. My reason for this is I want the majority of builds I feature to be available to players as early as possible in their class progression. That being said, even with the early progression options, Bless Knight is still very strong, as you will soon see. The basic attack I will be using is the Greatsword, which is available at level 4 on the knight. This basic deals a good chunk of damage, and if you use Divine Energy to play it, the Greatsword will critically hit, dealing double damage. Since these are divine attacks, they have the added benefit of piercing through evasion. If you have it unlocked, the alternative option would be the Tome of Light. Power-wise, I consider them to be pretty equal, but generally prefer the Greatsword because big damage numbers are fun. For the weapon power, I will be using the base power available to the knight, Fortified Weapon, which grants focus and armor. Ideally, I would go with Sanctified Weapon here, which grants access to Divine Cards. However, since it's unlocked at level 11 and Divine Cards, while strong, are not pivotal to the build, I feel just fine taking Fortified Weapon. Our starting card is going to be Smite. As you can see, this deals 5 piercing damage and grants 1 divine energy. This is perfect when combined with the greatsword, allowing you to quickly burst down early game opponents. In my ideal setup, I would use conversion here instead. Smite's divine energy generation tends to be a bit weaker in the late game, especially once you have more powerful alternatives, while conversion generally carries over into the late game in a much more powerful way, but is not unlocked until level 28, so I won't be using it for this run. Before we begin, there are a couple of things I would like to mention. I will be doing this and probably all future playthroughs on the challenging difficulty, which is one step above the default of normal. I have two main reasons for this. The first is that on the two hardest difficulties in the game, enemies fight differently to make things tougher. I want to leave it up to you to discover what that means. Second is on those two hardest difficulties, there is a also a bit of an easter egg I don't want to spoil. Additionally, I will only be playing the core or non-expansion maps. The expansions are amazing content, and if you are interested in them, I highly recommend picking them up. With those things in mind, I am still playing one level higher than the default difficulty setting, so if you are new to the game or playing on normal, this build will still be very successful. Now let's begin. Regarding most of this flavor text, I'm generally going to be just skipping through it since the story is not my main focus here. As for the footage itself, I will be speeding it up at times, especially in the later game when it's just blasting through enemies, but for the early game I will keep things slower and go over more of my decision making. 
Our first selection of events has two opportunities in it. These events do not get reshuffled into the zone deck and you only have this one chance to select them in keeping with their nature. And as their card description says, they can be beneficial or harmful. I will always prioritize selecting these and if you happen to get multiple, you just have to pick one. We will go with the right one here. Unfortunately, this is the exact event I did not want to see. Since I have the Knight class fully leveled, I start my runs with a healing potion, which can be combined with this event for a powerful benefit. However, since it would take newer players a decent amount of time to fully level a class, I'm going to forego that benefit this time. Had I obtained the potion naturally, I would have definitely used it here. We do, however, still get a small luck bonus. Here we'll pick the left opportunity. We won't get the weapon upgrade from this since our basics are divine attacks, but the rally blessing we get won't hurt. Again, we'll go with the opportunity. Not really concerned with the forge right now, so we'll just leave. And now we come to our first combat. The main focus of our early game combat is using smite to generate crits with our greatsword and then spending any excess energy on blocks for a little bit of mitigation. One thing to point out with the greatswords is they do not default to using divine energy. You can see as I move this card here, the highlighted energy changes. And there we have it, a quick easy fight thanks to our greatsword. Alright, and our very first card reward, and we get the key card I mentioned we are looking for with our Bless Knight build, which allows us to stack blessings based on our divine energy. We did indeed get very lucky with this reward, and I plan to take full advantage of it. Now, we don't have too many ways to generate divine energy right now, but hopefully soon we can start building that up. Again, we go with the opportunity, which gives us some gold and a fight. You can see in this fight a good example of the greatsword trying to use the wrong energy. Make sure you pay attention to that. And another great card reward here. This gives us a guaranteed source of divine energy on every turn and will really help get our blessings going. I do use my health potion here because I'm a bit salty still about the wounded animal, but ideally I probably should have held on to it. Our playstyle so far is not changing much, just relying on those greatsword crits to plow through the early fights, which is even easier now thanks to the Aura of Zeal. Now I am going to break one of my usual rules here and visit this shrine. Normally I would save shrines until the very end of a zone in order to maximize their potential, but in a case like this, when I know for sure what card I want to use at the shrine, I have no problem doing it early. So we will go ahead and duplicate our favor of the gods. This fight goes as expected thanks to the great swords, and with that we get our first level up. 
For talents, I always use my rerolls because there really is no downside. For this particular set of three, I think Bastion is the strongest for our build, so I will reroll the other. The first reroll gives us Headhunter, which I personally feel is one of the strongest talents in its rarity and is probably what I will pick, but I reroll Amalgamist anyway because again there is no downside. Looks like Headhunter it is. The rest of the zone proceeds as expected, with a small taste of blessings, but the great swords do most of the work. The first boss can be a bit annoying because they daze you every turn, allowing you to only play 4 action. Thankfully, we have the Headhunter talent, so we can play fairly aggressively knowing any damage will be completely reversed when we succeed. And it doesn't take long for our greatsword crits to carry us to victory. Before I leave a zone, I generally explore the area more to take advantage of anything left over. Looking at our deck here, I'm deciding if I want to remove my blocks at this point, which is what I normally do, but after thinking it over, I decided to keep them until my blessings were a bit more reliable. On our first visit to Bright Candle, I will go ahead and skip the blacksmith for now since the basic attack upgrades are not super important for us, but I will make a stop at the alchemist to pick up a healing potion. And with that, we move on to the eastern Blightwoods to deal with the bandit. On another version of Night, I would love to get this stew, but for this run, I'll pass. For now, the playstyle doesn't change much from the first zone, and we just continue relying on our greatsword crits to chunk down enemies. With this kill, we reach our second level up and are immediately presented with a very powerful option regardless of the build you're playing. I do reroll the other options in the rare chance something better comes up, but as expected, we end up taking Benevolent. And now back to whacking things with our greatswords.
Now here the mini boss Daisy comes up and I debated putting it off for a bit later, but with my newfound healing power I decided to take on the challenge. This mini boss can be a bit annoying because they can pretty reliably inflict pinned, which only allows you to play either the leftmost or rightmost card in your hand. Here you can see me fiddling with the card a bit, trying to get it to not use my divine energy so I can save it for the next turn, and a few blessings and crits later the fight is cleaned up nicely. We will finally go ahead and add another card to our deck with faith healing for a bit of sustain, but more importantly, more divine energy. Since we have another Shrine of Mirrors here, and we still want some more praise from our deities, we will duplicate our favor again. I check the blue shrine here, hoping for a shrine of levity to reduce the cost of my new faith healing, but we get unlucky. I do use the blacksmith for an upgrade, it's not really needed, but I have some extra gold and it will help speed things up a bit, so why not? We continue with mostly the same playstyle of hacking things down with our greatswords, but you will see with the addition of more divine energy, we are starting to rev up our blessing engine. In this fight here, you can really start to see the power of Benevolent. With only a few stacks of regeneration and rally, we are able to easily resustain ourselves, healing nearly back up to full health, and this is only a taste of what's to come. I go ahead and decide to recruit the merchant here in the hopes that we find some good cards to generate more divine energy. Unfortunately, the stock leaves a lot to be desired, so we may introduce Julius to the succubus later on if they don't get some better merchandise. I really debated on whether or not I wanted to pick up a fourth favor of the gods here since generally I consider three copies of a card in a smaller deck to be more than enough and indeed I do pass on it. With that, we move on to our second boss, the impeccably dressed Garvin Greaves. There isn't much difference here from the rest of the fights leading up to this, and we comfortably hack down the boss with our greatswords and a sprinkling of blessings to keep us healthy. I consider taking Hail of Steel here, but it's a bit expensive and isn't necessary for the build I'm going for, so I decide to skip it. Just like in the last zone, I will explore the area more, and this time I think I will go ahead and remove my block, since I don't feel they will provide any more value going forward. After that, we head back to Bright Candle, where hopefully the merchant has shaped up their act. And boy oh boy, it looks like our threats worked. This time around, our friend Julius has not one, but two great options that I consider amazing when playing Bless Knight, and I will be snagging both. The first is Bless Weapon, which as you can see, generates divine energy when you play basic attacks, and I mainly want it to help maintain my divine energy levels between turns. The second card I'll pick up is Invocation, this gives us divine energy for each of our blessings, and since we like to stack blessings, this card is an obvious pick for me. Both cards offer some additional healing, which is also a nice bonus. A quick look at our deck, and we decide to skip the blacksmith and head out to Noxlight Swamp. I want to take a look at this first fight, since we just got some fancy new cards that will really boost our blessing playstyle. Right off the bat, we take a pretty decent chunk of damage, but I'm not even the slightest bit worried. Now we have five divine energy to trigger our favor with, and you can start to get a glimpse of the power this card has to offer. Next turn, we trigger the favor with six divine energy, and you can see how powerful we start becoming. It's basically over for this frog. Finally though, we get to use invocation and unleash our true power. You can see how ridiculous this is starting to get, and it's only the beginning. Keep an eye on our blessings here throughout this next bit, since we should be generating them much more reliably now. 
we get our level 4 talent, which always offers an energy upgrade, and we just grab strength because I don't really care with this build. We check the merchant here just in case, and I do decide to pick up Wave of Light because it's a solid cleanse option. Again, I pass on a fourth favor because I just really like the number three for some reason. More of the same stuff here, generate divine energy, stack blessings, swing swords, and repeat. Now here we get the card game, which is a potentially dangerous opportunity, but I'm familiar with the options, so I'm not too worried. I considered taking the wheel here, which would have been safer, but I instead go with the hangman. It might be a bit dangerous, but I like the talent it gives you as a reward. Hopefully, we can outheal the extra poison. Things immediately start to get a little bit spicy with the poison and the inconvenient pin from that bear trap. but we make it through the first fight alive. I decide to use a few campfires to heal up a bit since I don't really need them for card removal at this point. taking a lot of damage in my fights here, but I'm not too concerned because there is an enemy in the swamp I will be using to heal back to full health. This particular creature regenerates health at the start of its turn, and at the same time reduces its maximum health, so you essentially have to kill it in one round, or just survive until it reduces its health to zero. In order to kill it more quickly, I will simply stack blessings until I have enough anger to hack it down. This method has the added benefit of usually healing me to full health. I consider deep faith here, but in the end I don't value it too highly and decide to pass. I almost take Radiant Recovery here, but after giving it some thought, since most of my healing will be from Rally and Regeneration, it most likely won't be very useful, so I pass. definitely take Aura of Divinity here. It's a bit expensive to play, but I should be able to imbue it after the swamp, and it will help keep our Blessing Engine running smoothly. A quick look at our deck here, and I decide to go ahead and remove a basic attack. By going down to four basics, I ensure that I won't accidentally get a handful of great swords, which is not ideal. I consider removing a surge card, but for now I decide to keep them and instead just reset the zone's poison mechanic for the boss fight. 
As we come up against the legendary enchanter, we of course start by playing our two enchantments to get things rolling. With our new card draw from the Aura of Divinity, we can now stack up blessings to a ridiculous amount much more rapidly. And honestly, Bolgar is kind of screwed at this point. We comfortably end the fight with full HP, a full bar of divine energy, and numerous stacks of nearly every blessing in the game. Man, I love this build. As always, we explore the area further, and as far as the orange shrine goes, I'm not interested for this particular build. I also choose not to fight the Wandering Slime because I'm not really fishing for any good card rewards and I don't like math. So with that, we move on to our next area, the Amber Mine. Right away, I decide to see what this green shrine is because I am very happy with the deck at this point and am more than comfortable using the benefit on one of my existing cards. And what a great shrine we get. This shrine lets us convert the cost of a card into blood, essentially making it free to play given how much healing we have. This upgrade is almost always a no question pick for me since a solid build should have plenty of sustain to negate the minor health loss. After looking through the deck, I decide on invocation for the upgrade since it's our most powerful source of divine energy. And a beautiful green wrinkly face will allow us to to get one of our enchantments imbued. You might think I would go with the Aura of Divinity first, since it costs more to play, but by imbuing the Aura of Zeal, we have access to guaranteed divine energy on our first turn. I checked this shrine for the same reason as before, and again we get lucky with the blood conversion. I consider using it on my remaining aura, but since I plan on imbuing that, I decide to use it on faith healing to create a no-cost divine divine energy source. After this fight, we get another level up and quite frankly don't get very great options. Out of these three, I consider aggressive to be the strongest, so I reroll the others. Even after the rerolls, however, aggressive still comes out on top and will help us end fights even faster. We speed our way through some events and fights here. I go ahead and remove my Surge of Strength because I'm finding myself not playing it most of the time when it's in hand, so it needs to go. We just continue blasting down enemies even faster now thanks to the increased anger generation. We leave the crates for the discount. And of course we get the axe and the stone right after removing the surge of strength we would have needed for it. Thankfully it's not too important for our build. Quick look at the deck to decide if I want either of these NPCs. As we continue to plow through enemies, you can see how thanks to our blessings, we are faced with no genuine threats and are able to quickly burst down everything in a few turns.
We reach our next level and are presented with a very nice thematic option, but since I don't have any sources of burning or any zeal interaction, I decide to pass and just make another of my cards free. And with that, we come to the boss with a brain slug in their head, Viola Skysworn. It goes basically like every other fight up until now as we stack up our blessings and swing for the fences with our greatswords making for an easy win. For the card reward, I do pick up Righteous Blades here for a bit of extra damage, and because Aura of Divinity is memorized, I know I can imbue this first without any real drawbacks. We quickly explore further, taking a look at the deck to see if I want to use the Blacksmith. I decide against it, and we move on to our next zone, the Deep. Starting off in the deep, we have the Hag, which is actually quite annoying because of its impervious and daze mechanic. I honestly may avoid them for the rest of the zone, but for now, we'll just try and defeat it as quickly as we can. The rest of the combat proceeds as expected, with our blessings stacking very quickly, allowing for easy kills. You may notice I do delay some kills by one turn. This is so I can end the fight with full health. I also tend to play more favors than I might need to, but I just love seeing those blessings stack up. Here we get the Muddy Puddle, but thankfully the options are not too bad. I probably should have removed the Surge, but I get rid of the Greatsword, leaving us with three, because again, for some reason I like having three copies of cards. Here we take on the Kraken mini-boss, which can be quite deadly versus some builds, but for the Blessed Knight is mere calamari. At this point, our card draw has become quite powerful, allowing us to play Bless Weapon multiple times in one turn. This takes advantage of the lasting keyword, which is fairly new at the time of this video, and allows us to carry the effect of Bless Weapon over into our next turn. For talent choices, I was torn between Thunder God and Fire Immunity, but because I like the cold and the late game burning potential scares me, I go with the immunity. We stop at our green friend to imbue Righteous Blades. For the Memorize Shrine, I decide to use one of our favors, that way we have some guaranteed turn one blessing.
And so we move on to the boss, the cursed pirate Captain Melkor. Who knows what kind of pirate life this poor sod had before falling to this terrible fate. This fight and the rest of the fights left to us will be more of the same repeated blessing spams. I'm very happy with the deck right now and I know there's still a hag waiting for me out there so instead of exploring more I decide to just get out of dodge immediately and head for our final map the Black Citadel. Again, most of this will just be repetitive blessing spam, but if anything interesting happens, I will make sure to comment on it. Even mimics are no threat, and while I tapped on the mimic by mistake, it rewards us with another blessed weapon, allowing us to further take advantage of its lasting effect. From here, I decide to just progress the zone as quickly as possible since I'm confident in our victory and there's really not much left to discuss about the build. That being said, after the first mini-boss we are given Righteousness which is going to take us from simply being overpowered to outright ridiculousness. One last visit to our old friend Bulgor to imbue our final enchantment, and I may dare to call this deck finished. Just kidding, let's go ahead and convert Righteousness to Blood Cost, since it wasn't crazy enough before. As you can see, with the addition of Righteousness, we can very rapidly draw through our deck to stack up numerous blessings. I finally remove my last surge, which is basically useless at this point. The remainder of the zone goes nice and smoothly, and we pick up our final talent. The options are not great, but I decide to take the free impervious because I'm a blessed knight and it's a blessing. Big brain plays. A quick weapon power reset at the blacksmith for a double boost on the final boss, and we are off to the defiled sanctum. As you can see, the lord of despair is actually quivering because our blessed knight is disgusting at this point. With one turn, we are able to easily pump out 20 to 30 stacks of nearly every blessing in the game, reaching up to a whopping 77 stacks on haste. We have already done about a third of the boss's health and damage, and quite frankly, there is no possible way that Dante will even be able to give us a scratch. After stacking our blessings up as much as possible before hitting a bit of fatigue from all our card draw, we put the Lord of Despair out of their misery on only the second turn. And with that, our Blessed Knight run is complete and peace is restored to the Shattered Realms. All in all, I think that was a solid run for this build. We managed to pick up the majority of cards I was looking for, and while we had some not-so-great talents, getting Benevolent was a huge plus. 
I do wish we had gotten access to divine cards to feature some of the talents and card options that open up, but it just goes to show how strong this build is even without divine cards or the most ideal talents. If you are interested in the deck details, I will post a link in the description to the deck on blightbane.io, which if you don't know is essentially the Dawncaster wiki and is an extremely valuable and well-built website. Thank you so much for joining me today, I really hope you all enjoyed the video. Make sure to obey your YouTube overlords by liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment, and I will see you next time, wanderers.